Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Young, and I am the moderator for this uh, Yale Career Panel on investment banking. I happen to also be an investment banker, but uh, uh, I'm not functioning as a panelist uh, uh, today. I just want to talk briefly about this program uh, and why it, it exists, and then we'll go on to introduce uh, uh, you know, our panelists and, and have our discussion. Uh, this was uh, started uh, nine, nine and a half years ago, and this is actually the 40th Yale mm -hmm. Career Panel. Uh, and it was started mainly by a group of Yale alumni, and I was one of those, where we really felt that there wasn't uh, enough candid information about different professions. That we had all these Yaleys who were very smart, but weren't really, uh, didn't have access to kind of balanced, candid information about different uh, professions. And you know we're all subject to the kind of myths and things that TV shows and so forth, uh, you know, have. I mean, I like to laugh that you know, in real life as a lawyer, you don't solve a case every ten minutes, you know, between commercial breaks. And we all know that once NCIS and all of those and uh, you know shows the number of people who all, you know, applied for forensic, you know, uh, science is massive. Uh, but uh, anyone's in that profession knows it's not nearly as sexy as what it looks like on TV, right? So the whole idea is not to steer people towards one profession or another, but just to help them go into professions, the right profession for them, but also uh, based, based on correct information, right? The only thing we can't do, which we strongly encourage all of you who are listening today, is to do a really good job of self-assessment. Because even if someone gives you perfect information about investment banking, if you don't do a good job of understanding yourself and understanding what you really like and what you don't like and what you're good at, the, you know, perfect information about the profession still won't be enough, right? So make sure that you do a candid assessment of yourself uh, and get some help from people who are willing to be brutally honest with you about what you really uh, are, are good at or what you, what you really uh, you know, your personality fit is. Uh, so with that, uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, oh, and by the way, there is also a series called Yale Fireside Chats, Career Fireside Chats, covering issues such as how do you network? How do you get on boards? How do you, how do you make major career changes? And that started about two years ago. We've got about eight of those. So, uh, and those of you who want to watch the ones from the past, just go to YaleCareerPanels.com. Uh, and there's a list of all of the, uh, you know, all of the uh, events, and also uh, the links to watch uh, the recording. Uh, with that, what I'm going to do is uh, I am going to first just introduce. We have a wonderful panel here, and I think what's really wonderful is it's very diverse. I mean, uh, some pe people who uh, uh, start out on research, some people from, you know, corporate finance. We have people who work for large firms. We have people working for mid-sized firms. And this is very good. So you get different perspectives from the different panelists. Uh, we have Andrew Carlin, who's a director at Edge, uh, Edgemont uh, Partners. He's in healthcare and investment banking. And Edgemont is a, is a boutique firm. Uh, we have uh, Jane Merling, who is a founder of uh, Eek. I'm, I'm not going to pronounce it properly. Uh, Eloquence, eloquence, right? And she, which is not an investment banking firm, but she'll explain what she does. But she had a long career in investment banking uh, on the research and other sides. Federico Manila uh, is a managing director at Rothschild and co head of their chemical and materials practice, and has had the fortune of working both for large and medium sized investment banks. So it's, it'll be interesting to hear his comparison. And Adam Reeder is a partner at Rothschild, and he's a global head, co-head of the building products and materials and distribution uh, practice, and has a BA in architecture, right? <laughs> but in a different, uh, went in a different direction. So with that, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through the questions that were on was were on the invitation, and we're just going to really have a discussion, and each of the panelists will uh, talk on things that they feel uh, that they 
have a point of view and, and, or, or, or that they want to convey. So the first one is this, all professions uh, go through different cycles, right? Uh, you know, what it was like to be a doctor 30 years ago is different from what it's like to be a doctor today. It'll be different from what it'll be like a doctor 20, 30 years from now. So with that question, where is the profession heading, investment banking, uh, good and bad, right? Because uh, investment banking, like medical, has changed dramatically over the last 20 years and will change, uh, you know, going forward. So this is not directed to any specific, any, any panelist who wants to address this issue, please go ahead. Well, I have one observation, even though I am not the official investment banker on this panel, but I think it would be um, relevant to think about, um, you know, investment bankers and the adjunct professions of equity research, trading, sales have always been the gateway to capital raising, right? Um, and there's a strict way of doing it and, you know, et cetera. Certainly we've seen um, changes to how capital is raised. And then more recently, um, and I'm not an expert on any of this, but there have been um, uh, an emergence of other ways of doing an IPO circumventing right some of the traditional um, investment banks some of the official regulations you know that go along with it so I just wanted to sort of raise that as the you know, kind of backdrop of some things that have been shaking things up a bit for the better or worse I can't say yeah and it's not just in capital raising for example the brokerage side right with uh, well, artificial intelligence and so forth that's definitely changing the lives of the people who are on the brokerage side and wealth management. I mean, all in, it's it's the theme, you know, some people will call it the democratization of, you know, capital markets, which is a whole other panel discussion. But it is it is a force to be reckoned with, I think, if you are coming into the industry now, you know, to be thinking about that. Adam, you, you what changes have you seen over the last five, 10 years and what changes you think are gonna happen on the corporate finance and M&A side, which is where you are, right, uh, you know, going forward. Sure, thank you. Um, I, well, I guess what I'd, I'd put into perspective is there are some things that are changing in, a, in an almost disruptive fashion. And, and I would say that in these professions generally, if, if you're uncomfortable with change, this is probably not the place for you. Um, because frankly, every day is different, every month is different, and there are some dramatic changes, not just cyclical, but structural, some of what Jane was talking about uh, and Peter were talking about uh, in the industry um, episodically. Uh, I would say that certainly technology in all forms uh, is, a, is a disruptor of all industries and, and ours is no interest, no different, including the advice side of the business because there are tools around AI based and otherwise around valuation, et cetera, that are making things that were not a commodity, more of a commodity that are making them easier for corporate uh, leaders to access or their teams to access directly. And so I think that will be a continuation kind of forever. There's a trend toward commoditization in a lot of these products and processes. So I expect that to continue and I expect it to continue in ways that I can't even envision today in the near term, well within my lifetime. The thing that I will just say, Peter, that, that, that has not changed. And in fact, if anything, it's been a little back to the future and that I don't see changing is the need for trusted advice. That is a human element that you trust other people to be your advisor and your confidant. And no matter what technology they, they or you use, and no matter what the metrics or tools or processes are, that decision-making judgment applying process is a constant in something that is an intellectually based uh, I would call it intellectual capital-based part of the business. Andrew, you have any comments on the changes you've seen in the last 10 years and what what you see going ahead? Yeah, no, certainly. I think I think Jane and Adam both hit on some some very good points. So I, I think if I think, you know, look about if you think about uh, equity capital markets, debt capital markets and, and MA, equity capital markets, certainly the the advent of SPACs over the last 10 years has been uh, has been transformative in 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 in, um, uh, 
in the, the amount of capital that's going into uh, private companies. Um, we're already, you know, Q1 of 2021, we've already raised more, more, um, more SPAC funding than, than, than last year and sort of back-to-back -back record years, 2020, 2021. And that trend probably won't continue um, too much longer, but it is, uh, it's another way that private companies can, can become public. Um, direct listings, as, as, as Jane mentioned as well, and then um, um, you, you also have um, more of the internationalization of, of, um, of, of IPOs as well. Um, on the debt capital market side, there's the advent of, of um, uh, greater technology to help streamline some of the processes and the analytics, um, both AI and ML, and, and also just more sophisticated software programs. To, to run some of the analytics. And then on the M&A side, I think um, from, from my point of view, the pandemic has, has, has sort of accelerated a number of, 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 of elements, uh, particularly um, the ability to, to work uh, remotely and do a lot of advisory over video calls. Um, oh God, uh, don't talk about remote working, Andrew. What is that? <laughs> You got a lot of people here like Zoom fatigue. You just touched yeah. on a on a live nerve. <laughs> I know. Yeah. So I think um, the ability to to do some of the 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 the, the due deal, you know, to do a lot of it remotely, um, uh, and and I think that'll. I mean, I think that I think the sort of in person meetings will will uh, will will, will um, still be important um, post pandemic, but. Um, I think teams can, you know, have proven to be sort of operate more remotely. And, and so, um, you know, we, the, the, the nature of M&A processes has, has changed a fair degree, um, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, the, the types of sale processes are, um, uh, it, given the, the, the ability to, to have video sessions with the management teams. There's an ability sort of earlier on in the process to have buyers get to know management um, and, and sort of get a get a valuation read before a more formal IOI or LOI submission. So it actually creates um, creates uh, actually more room for, for the buyers to get to know the management teams. In the, in the but, you, but, you know, I think some of those changes that are pandemic related, they were coming anyway. But it, there are some bigger changes beyond pandemic driven, driven things. Like Adam saying, where like the commodities, a lot of this commoditization was happening no matter what, right? And uh, Frederico, you you and I have been around long, so we 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 know what it's like when there were no analysts and all sorts of things. God forbid, right? Right. I I would like to maybe step back and put it more in the um, in the changes like the the secular changes in the business. I mean, when uh, when we started in the business, Adam and I and you, Peter. Um, a lot of the firms in investment banking were partnerships, uh, smaller partnerships, uh, non-public, and uh, there was what was called last Eagle Act, they separated the investment banks and the commercial banks. After the repeal of the act, uh, there was a, a rush uh, to, to streamline, to make what was called the universal bank or the one bank uh, from uh, you know people like, uh, uh, Morgan Stanley and Goldman and others were in public and some of the commercial banks in Europe uh, were acquisitive here. And so they built these huge things. And then more recently, I think we realized that there is no one size fit all. Yeah. Uh, some, there are still large banks, there are still uh, uh, boutiques, they're still uh, almost like solo individuals or solo practitioners uh, that can do this. In a way, um, what this means is for people, for students who are looking at this as an opportunity, is that uh, they should really be um, open to going into investment banking, realizing that there are many ways uh, to be successful. Mm -hmm. There is yeah. no one size fit all. Yeah, um, and in fact, in fact, I think Frederick, you're right. Because first of all, there's a wide variety of sizes and strategies, right? But the other is. The reality is there are many different professions within investment banking. I have to tell you, if you're in commodities trading or whatever trade, that's a radically different job than being an M&A or research or whatever. So one of the things you've got to recognize is 
within investment banking, there are different professions that have very different futures, but also very different matches with individuals, right? Uh, you know, one of my friends who was on the, on the trading side at Lehman Brothers when I was at Lehman, he said, you know, I started out m and I went over to trading and my attention span went from five minutes, sort of, to two seconds. And in fact, my attention span is less than my six month old son, but that's, a, that's how different those professions are. So part of it is you have to look at it as many different professions and then say, which of them might fit with me? Because it could be very different, right? Uh, one question. So how did each, how, how did people get into this profession and what's a typical career path, which obviously based on what I just said is an impossible question to answer, but any comments about that, you know? Uh, you know, I, I think everybody gets into these uh, professions uh, in different ways. Um, in my case, I, uh, I graduated. Um, I was actually uh, more interested in consulting. And then to a friend of mine who was looking for an analyst in investment bank, um, he asked me to, um, to interview and I became uh, um, an analyst uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, a year before going to uh, to Harvard Business School. Um, I think that uh, there is far more today of a structure than there was when we started. But one of the ideas that I would advise everybody to do at some point in, in the job search is to be very honest and set up a, a little Venn diagram where you put what do you like, what you don't like, what you're good at, and what you're not good at. And be honest, sometimes people like to travel and sometimes people don't. Sometimes people are very technical. Some people are more business oriented. Some people are more numbers oriented. Uh, some people are uh, people oriented. So it really depends what your interests are. And then you can try to narrow uh, your, your thoughts in order to choose the profession, whether investment banking is the right thing for you, if you being this. Uh, the people who are presumably considering it, uh, is not something you can decide a priori. You may also want to try it. Um, and then if you don't like it, you can move around. One of the great things about investment banking is very portable. What you learn are skills that you can take with you, whether you remain in the profession, whether you want to move geographically, whether you want to move uh, as, as an industry, where you go into private equity and or other professions, or, or, or whether or not you want to stay in investment banking. Uh, in this point, uh, both Adam and, and Peter and I have uh, been in investment banking most of our professional lives. So obviously we like it and we are good at it. Uh, you have to believe you have to be good at it, uh, but you have to, to keep a sense of humor uh, while you apply. And the last little, little example that I thought was very funny was one day I was uh, interviewing for an investment banking job and uh, it was at the end of a long day and I had two on ones uh, looking at me and they asked me um, if you were an animal what animal would you be and I was <laughs> flabbergasted I did not know how to answer and then I looked at them can I ask you a question but sure what animal are you hiring this year <laughs> and, and they looked at me and I said I'll be whatever animal you want me to be and I did get the job uh, but but I just wanted to share with you how you have to really be flexible in this. So, oh, it, 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 you you just did a variation on the accounting joke where the creative accountant just asked his boss who said, "What number do you want it to be?" Right? <laughs> right. Exactly. Believe it or yeah. not, someone just asked me that question yesterday on an yeah. interview. I mean, that people are still asking this question is just- I, I'm, I'm sorry, I did not know I would have given you the answer in advance. My, my, since I was interviewing for an HR job, my answer was, please don't ever ask that question. Okay. Yeah. Answer it ever. <laughs> now, but Jane, you, you came up in a different side of the business, yeah, yeah. right? So maybe you could talk a little bit about that side of investment banks Sure. in terms of sort of what the career paths are like, right? Yeah, so for me, I didn't get into any part of investment banking through sort of traditional um, channels in that I, so I graduated from Yale and I was an English literature major and I never intended to be 
in financial services or on Wall Street or in banking. I literally didn't know what a stock from a stock was. I mean, that was it. And, um, you know, many of my, my classmates were doing what, you know, the, the, the sort of regular way in, which is to interview for the two year quote unquote analyst programs. And I would imagine if we have current students, you know, if they're familiar with this, right? The banks come and recruit on campus for investment banking, sales, trading, sometimes research. <clears throat> um, and, you know, you, if you get hired, you're spending two years post BA in the trenches, right? Working on one of these things. And that is, you know, a big way into the business. I, um, however, didn't intend, so I didn't interview for any of it. I, I got out of Yale, I was flat broke. Um, I answered an ad in the New York Times to be a receptionist at a um, investment management firm, a firm that still exists today called Newberger Berman. Um, and so my first job was a receptionist. And um, I, one of my jobs was I was responsible for ordering the lunch platter, the sandwich platter for the portfolio managers um, when company managements came in to present to the analysts and the portfolio managers. Wonderful um, skill that has carried you well <laughs> in the rest of your career, right? Tuna fish, chicken salad. I mean, it's all you know, coleslaw, potato salad. It's all there. But I mean, I stood in the back of the room. I didn't just leave the sandwiches and go. I stood in the back of the room and I listened to what were the company management saying? What were the CEOs saying? What were the analysts asking them? What were the, um, you know, the, the portfolio managers? And I got very interested. I mean, I thought I was going to go get a PhD in, in literature. That's, I thought this was a, you know, a two-year stopgap on the way. Um, and I became truly fascinated with equity research because it, is, um, it resonated with me as a business in which you build a very deep expertise in one particular area. Sounds a lot like academics in a way, right? Um, so I wound up just really becoming captivated with the business. I got myself promoted um, from receptionist and, you know, to research assistant. And, you know, that was it for me. I had to go back. I had to go back to business school because I had never studied any of the, you know, related um, but you, but you, but you identified uh, part of the business that resonated with you, right? That you yeah. liked the, the getting a deep understanding of a company, and and you got to know that by watching, right? Which is right. And you know, I I am a very data oriented person, although I didn't know it going into it at the time, right? But um, so I really loved the you know that developing that expertise and the. The very long, I mean, a lot of stock recommending as an analyst has become quite short term, but in that era, um, it, it had a much longer term, you know, um, perspective. So, you know, first order thinking, second order thinking, but also, you know, the ability to build these deep long term relationships with clients in an advisory way, and also with, you know, the company managements, which I found endlessly, you know, fascinating. What yeah, made and that's why it's really good that you're on this panel because the you know the time frame of the studying something is very different than say corporate finance right you're doing yeah. a debt offering you know you're not saying i want to understand this company so well that and i'm going to follow them for the next five years right um, it, 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 I, I no mean, i'm saying I'm, yeah. I'm just saying the difference between you know corporate finance m a and and research is a different you know there, there's similarities but there's some big differences right well, I think the investment bankers, I mean, Federico, ha I know, has industry expertise because he focuses on certain silos of the, of the market, similar to an equity research analyst, although his sort of universe of exploration is bigger than an equity research analyst is really, really drilling down. And so I, I don't, I'm not as familiar with the other two bankers here, but I mean, most of us wind up, I think, developing an expertise in a particular um, industry and we also wind, wind up following those companies and you know we have to know where they've been to be able to either you know extrapolate where they're going or to be able to give advice to them about where we think they should go so um, but yes it, it, there is still a different time frame I think between an equity research analyst and uh, um, 
a, a, a true investment banker because their lives, I think, gentlemen, tell me if I'm wrong, are, can be, are more punctuated by the rhythm of specific transactions. It's a yes and yeah. no. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Go no. ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Adam. I was going to offer, I, I, I would agree in some circumstances, I would take a contrary point in others. Um, and I might separate it a different way, which is I think a research analyst and people on the trading floor are fundamentally actually not trying to predict where the company goes. They're actually paid to predict where the stock price goes. Uh, and that may be correlated, should be, often ought to be, but is not always correlated with where the company goes. I think we're paid for both. I mean, I think you make a Fair. decision, but we, we have to be able to do both. Fair. But I was, what I was going to say is some of the clients that, that many of us have are clients we've had for decades through multiple leadership teams uh, and maybe were part of a client team that had existed for decades before uh, we were on that team. And I would share that our understanding of those companies in some ways will never be as deep as the leadership in terms of the business, but sometimes can be even deeper than their understanding of the dynamics within their own company. So different circumstances, I would say different time frames. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now we, we, let's move to the, to the next question, which is my favorite question which is what are the myths versus the realities? In every profession, every profession known to mankind has myths and realities, right? And I was joking about the, the legal one where you know, all the TV shows, you solve a legal case, you know, you know, 10 minutes. But similarly, investment banking has myths and realities. And maybe, uh, yeah, Adam, you, you, Andrew, you haven't spoken, uh, you know, in the last five minutes. So maybe you, if, if you have an opinion about that, you know, uh, or if not, we'll pass to someone else. But what are some of the myths and realities uh, of investment banking that you think would be helpful to this audience? Um, yeah, I mean, I think reality is it, it is a it is a profession that requires a significant amount of work. Um, you need to be prepared to, you know, um, spend, you know, a lot of your waking hours working. Um, and that's going to be different depending on what segment of investment banking you're in, um, whether it's on the sales and trading side or the equity capital market side or the capital markets or M&A. But certainly in, uh, in M&A, it's, it's a very unexpected schedules. Um, you need to be, you have to be very flexible and you have to make a number of personal sacrifices to make it, to make it work. Um, there are, um, yeah, I mean, I think you need to go in with eyes wide open that it is, uh, you know, you're, you're going to be uh, challenged and pushed, but you are going to build, it's, it's a, it's a career that gives you, I think, unparalleled um, uh, access to management, to understanding uh, the way businesses work, um, operations, soup to nuts, and, um, and, and strategy around, around growth and, and positioning a business for, you know, to maximize value and, and maximize um, uh, value, not only for shareholders, but, but all stakeholders. And um, it gives you tremendous skill sets, financial analysis, skill sets, project management, um, skill sets as, as well as myths, top two or three myths about it that everybody believes um, but it's not true. I'll, I'll pass it over to Adam. I don't know. Um, yeah. he's uh, you me. know, I will comment, which is uh, investment banking does have an image. The funny thing is there, are, there aren't a lot of TV shows about investment banking, you know, and they have one or two movies, you know, Wolf on Wall, you know, Wall Street, whatever. And, you know, and uh, greed is good. Remember that film. But for the most part, you know, it's not subject to movies and, and TV shows. So you don't have myths because of the media entertainment. But there are a lot of myths. And I think one of them is people overstate how sexy it is. Right. They, they think, oh, it's a really sexy profession. And, and the reality is a lot of it is not sexy, but also as, as Andrew said, you better be prepared to devote a lot of hours to it because that's the nature of how these firms are run today, right? And so it, the trade-off is you can make a lot of money if, if you're good uh, and there's a lot of excitement, but there is something you gotta give up. 
Now, Adam, you, you, you were about to say something. I was going to make two points, one of which you made, which is if you think you're coming into this because it's a glamorous profession, you're making a big mistake. All it takes is a, uh, a week of nights at the Holiday Inn in Pontotoc, Mississippi, or being left at the Detroit airport with no available hotels, and you'll realize it's not a glamorous profession. Um, but I would, I, would, I would emphasize the point you made, which is this is a big give, big get choice meaning it asks everything you have in terms of your time, your intensity, your focus. It's a little bit sometimes like running a marathon at the pace of a sprint. Uh, and it will, and it, will, it will take everything you have to give and ask a little bit more. Now, what you get is equal in proportion. You get a seat at a table at an age you can't imagine seeing decisions being made by corporate leaders who have spent their lives building an expertise or building an enterprise, and you get to be in the room and maybe part of the conversation as that happens. But you have to decide that that's the choice you wanna make because this whole concept, and I'll, I'll shatter this myth, this concept of work-life balance is a very tenuous, difficult one. I would say it's really work-life integration. You need to make sure that your work and your personal life can live with each other um, and construct your life that way. And investment banking is tough on marriages. And I think if you just look at the data, uh, a lot of people, they, they don't retire at 65. You know, they, they, they leave the profession in their forties either because they just, you know, and often it's just, they feel it's burned out. That's just the reality, right? I mean, Adam, you and Frederico and I are, unusual in that we've been around for a while. So, you know, God knows the reason why, but, you know, most of, almost all my peers that went investment banking when I did are no longer investment banking, right? And, but for a lot of uh, different reasons. Frederico, any myths versus realities? I think actually I would like to point out, maybe it's not a myth, but I'd like to point out how important it is to be flexible about the qualifications you have in order to come in. I think that too many people think, oh, I have to be a business major uh, in order to be an investment banker. In fact, you have an architecture uh, major in, in Adam. Um, I was uh, I started as a, classics, as a classics major, uh, but actually the one thing that helped me uh, significantly in my profession has been being an actor at Yale. And uh, I thought that acting was a great way to uh, transfer some of those skills, reading an audience, uh, uh, entertaining them at times, uh, um, improvising, uh, being uh, able to convince people. So all of that are relevant. So don't think that you have to be doing accounting in undergraduate in order to be successful. You can do that, but what you need is, is be flexible. Uh, in, in, it's a challenging, uh, profession, but it also is extremely satisfactory, in my opinion, because you deal with smart people doing important decisions and, and building what Adam said. Um, uh, earlier on, you're able to witness and watch um, things that are very important to a corporate setting. You are a corporate psychiatrist in some way. And, and so uh, that to me is is relevant not to forget uh, when you apply uh, the skills you have and the ability you have to transfer that and then be successful in that profession. That's right. Well, these are very helpful perspectives, and you know, and I, and I do think though that uh, one thing to think about is if you're in business, you're running the business or you're producing products. If you're in consulting, you never produce a product, you give advice, but you never implement it. And I actually started out at Bain & Company when it, when it was a relatively young company, there were very few people, except for Mitt Romney and Bill Bain. And I left when there were 800 people, but <clears throat> I left in part because you never got to implement anything. And the nice thing about investment banking, it's really both. You create the product, but you actually make the product, right? whether it's, you know, you see it through. And that's a big difference. And if that's important to you, then that's a plus about investment. Um, <clears throat> the next question is, 
which I think all of you have sort of touched on a little bit is, what are the characteristics of people who tend to do well and are happy in the profession? Any, any one of you can, uh, can comment. So I was once told, and I've, I've come to believe this wholeheartedly, that the single most defining characteristic of a successful long-lived uh, tenured investment banker is optimism. Uh, in all honesty, a lot of this profession is about getting kicked in the teeth repeatedly and getting up the next day and doing it all over again. Uh, and you have to be passionate about it and you have to be optimistic about it. Um, look, I think there are a number of other attributes that, are, that make one successful, right? Having a, an agile mind, being facile uh, with quantitative concepts, being articulate with the spoken and written word, those are all key attributes. But in terms of the things that allow you to continue doing this, which is a, which asks a lot for a long period of time, I would say high on the list is optimism. Jane, any comment? Jane, uh, you raise your hand. Yep. Yeah, I do. I mean, I think, you know, optimism is a good way of putting it. And the sort of corollary, corollary to that is that you have to be extremely comfortable in a world of uncertainty, right? Because obviously the dynamism, the cyclicality, the, you know, we can predict the markets, but you know a lot of a lot of things don't go on, you know, forever. So optimism is one way of, of approaching it. I think also being someone who is able and actually thrives being off consensus is very important for a lot of the professions, right? The herd always chases, you know, will will come around the consensus and will chase the same investment idea, the same theme, the same deal. Um, the real money is made, I don't mean personal money, but the real, you know, um, big effective, you know, either investment recommendations or, or investments or ideas come from people who can be, see and be comfortable out of the consensus. And I have to say that being out of the consensus can be a very uncomfortable, you know, period to uh, um, place to be. So I think that is very important for true. It doesn't mean you can't be successful without it, um, but home runs are hard to lift off without that. I think. Yeah, I'll add two comments. One is uh, you have to be able to do a lot of things at the same time. You know, there's no such yes. thing as. Uh, working on one project at a time, one new business. But you can't multitask, and I know that's a fancy word that everybody likes to use, but it's just true because at any one time, you're gonna be working on four, five, six different things. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you can't do that, and uh, then uh, uh, you're gonna be a failure. By the way, I was at Solomon Brothers, and I won't mention the name, but a very famous guy who ran OMB very smart guy was hired by John Goodfriend. And he was like a failure because he could only work on one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. And he did a great job if you gave him one thing, even if it was very complicated, couldn't work on you know, multiple things at the same time. The, uh, the, I think the other is you gotta live with, with the fact that you don't have a control over a lot of your life. Mm -hmm. The number of people who can tell you what to do is large, even if you're a managing director or a group head. Mm -hmm. I was running all the chemicals at Lehman Brothers. I lost count how many people would tell me to do something that I couldn't say no. But I think the, uh, and it's worse if you're, if you're more junior. Um, and, and so your control over your life is less than, well, less than other professions, right? Yeah. You know, and so you just got to live with that because it's the nature of the job, right? But something you said just raised another core quality that ultimately I think you need to be successful. And some people will say it will work against you in the short run. You have to have an internal ethical compass because, right, people will demand things of you. They'll tell you no. They'll tell you you have to do something. I'm not talking about like a, a project, right? And it is a highly regulated industry, but at the end of the day, it is self-regulated. And, um, you know, just having that strong internal ethical compass is really critical if you're going to sustain your career and your life. 
um, on, you know, in, in these businesses, I think. Frederico, any comments? You, I could see you're, you're about to say I, I something. Had, I had uh, two other comments. One is that you have to be able to live with uncertainty and, uh, and uh, be able to make decisions on uh, 51 percent of the data, not on 89. I mean, I worked at McKinsey uh, before, and uh, uh, you know, you do one thing, you drill down, you know everything you want. Here, you you do a lot of things. You, you talked about, let's call it multitasking, and and the information you have is incomplete, and you have to focus on on what you can. Uh, the second thing is, uh, uh, and this again is. Uh, uh, an idea that uh, maybe um, others can comment on is the fact that uh, when you make um, a decision in uh, uh, to work on investment banking, you have to also be able to um, be persuasive in in a way that uh, that is unusual because uh, it, it, it's it's a it's not a very uh, kind of vertical structure within the bank is like partners, uh, you have to convince people to do it. You have to convince clients. Uh, you are always able to, you can interact with people, but it's not you order people to do it. In, in a corporation, uh, very often you have clear lines of command. You report to me that reporting is far more fluid. So people have to work in a very fluid environment within the organization and whatever they do outside the organization. So it requires both an intellectual, uh, uh, curiosity, but also in a high emotional quotient, like you, you, your EQ has to be high. You have to be able to be very, to understand and to listen and to be very, in order to be effective, at least on the MA side or the advisory side. Andrew, question for you and for all of you is, are any of the things that you're saying different if you're at a large firm versus a medium or a small firm? Andrew, maybe you can you can comment, right? Yeah, no, I think so. I I, I have had the opportunity to work at both a full service or full service bank as well as a global middle market investment bank and a boutique bank. I think it's um, I think a lot of this applies across um, each of those types of firms with respect to MA advisory, where I've spent most of my my time over the last decade. Um, I just I think it is part of the nature of the industry that it is um, you know those you know, that, that sort of uh, level of work is expected uh, and that culture does sort of is, is um, uh, pervasive sort of throughout the, the industry that, that there's a focus on high work ethic, um, high degree of flexibility, um, folks that um, can be resilient and optimistic and um, you know, thoughtful and, and, you know, and have passion to, to help their clients are the ones that really um, can continue and, and succeed going forward and, and we sort of regardless of which um, size of firm um, that they're in, in my, my, my opinion. Enrico, you've been at, you know, you've had a career in firms of different sizes. Any, any comment on that question? Um, I think, uh, I would separate this from the way uh, somebody who just graduated wants to start in investment banking to a later point in the career. If you have to start in general, I would probably try to start at the larger firm. They, are, they have programs, uh, they have a better name, well-known and the like. Um, and you, if you don't like one thing or one person or one group or one activity, you can move within the firm. Um, going into a smaller firm, it, uh, it's a high beta, higher risk situation. It can work better, but at the same time, it uh, may, um, may cause people to, uh, to, to, to find that the job they have is not what they expected or they work with a few people that they don't like, and so they have less flexibility. No matter what, um, I would encourage people to, uh, to look at, uh, at the end of the day, whoever you're gonna work with, try to understand the culture of the place and the people you're gonna be working with. Because you work so hard, you might as well enjoy the people, trust them, the ethical part, the intellectual part, the job, but really you have to trust the people, not uh, 
uh, not the institution. But I would I would yeah. I would add to your comment, and that is, your you need to meet have better political skills at a large firm than in a boutique. And that's what you really got to, you know, there's some people who are better at politics and figuring out stuff and others who are not. If you feel you're really good at politi politics, you at least earn the right to be at a large firm because there's just a lot more politics. If you just feel, you know, I'm just not good at politics, then I think you should try to focus more on mid, uh, you know, mid to boutique firms. Um, Adam, you were about to say something. And then I know Jane, you were going to say something, Adam. I was going to say there, there are two different things. Well, I, so I've been at very little firms and very large firms. And I remember when I was part of Dylan Reed and we were sold to a firm that ultimately became UBS. Uh, one of my more senior colleagues uh, described it to a client and said, in terms of what changed, he said, all of the things that used to be easy have become difficult. And all those things that used to be difficult have become easy. Um, meaning I could get a decision by walking into the CEO's office at a smaller firm and have a conversation instead of having to figure out who the 17 influencers are and committees are that you had to organize around that. So I think there's an element of, are you, are you more comfortable with a lot of clear lines, if not bureaucracy? Some people can say organization, other people call it bureaucracy. Or are you more comfortable in a more entrepreneurial, Peter, as you're talking about, less hierarchical, less political, more entrepreneurial, but some others would call that disorganized. Right. Jane, you were, you were going to make a comment? Yeah, um, sort of what you were just saying, Peter, and then also what Adam said. I, I actually would counter a little bit. I, I've worked at large, very, very, very big firms and smaller ones and, you know, down to a size of a thousand people. And I found the politics um, brutal at all sizes because a lot of times when you get into a small firm, you have to be careful. I think this gets to what Federico is saying, you know, about the culture and the people. A lot of times these small firms are real cultures of a single personality. Uh, good um, point, good point. And this is this is really true on the hedge fund side. It may not be as much a case on like a smaller private, I think it is a case on a smaller private equity firm, like that, but it is, it can be quite treacherous. And, and this gets a little back to the myth question. I, I, I wanna say something that's gonna sound a little snarky, even the largest, you know, blue chip, world class banks, platforms that you want to talk about, most of these firms are pretty poorly managed. Ah, good point. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, this comes from my perspective as a manager and also then moving on to the HR side, right? Um, and I think it also gets back to the quality of, you know, what makes you successful. You have to be prepared for that. When you start out, there are programs and there are tracks you're on, but those fade out really quickly in your career. And then you are in the pool and it's not always fair. Decisions are not always made correctly with data or you know, any of the things that you know, should be. So I think one has to prepare oneself for a career that um, you're a bit on your own and you may find a mentor or a sponsor along the way, you may not. Um, and it, it can be really poorly managed and can really, I think, dishearten a lot of, you know, people about how their career progresses. So yeah, I, I think you make a good point, Jane. And, and, you know, here's a case of a myth versus reality. I mean, the outside world thinks investment banks are really managed well, and they're not. They're really not. There's no emphasis, you know. It, it, you know, it's the sad thing is right, that yeah. they're, they're, you know, people are promoted based on revenues. And I remember once talking to a CEO of a company that's a client of mine, I said, if you hire, if you only promoted people based on their revenues, what would happen? He said, it'd be disaster because a lot of, some of the people who are good at revenue generating are good managers, but many of the people who are good at sales are terrible at running anything. Mm -hmm. and, and so imagine at these large investment banks, when I was at Lehman, what I figured out, because I had run businesses before I went to investment banking. I had a lot of operating experience. And when, when I was running the chemical group at Lehman, I just told the head of investment banking, I said, I know you won't like this, but I'm going to run like a small firm within the firm. Right. And so my practices, as far as how I manage financial analysts and other people, whatever is going to be different. Mm -hmm. uh, but here's the deal. If I produce the following revenue, you'll let me do it. Right. The moment I don't, you can tell me what to do. 
and 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 that's how it went and it and it went well because like you know the idea that you take a financial analyst and say say we got to do the following lbo run and oh by the way i won't give i won't sit down with you and think about the logical you know you know options to run just do 50 runs and i'll look at and tell you whether i like any of them it's a bunch of bullshit right like in my firm and when i was at lehman we sit down and if you really spent 20 minutes with managing director, you figure out there are really only three runs that made any sense, right? But if you do it the other way, the goddamn, you know, financial analyst like burns, you know, hours and hours, and then often they throw all 50 runs out. So I agree with you, you know, if they were better managed, you know, but it's not gonna change, right? I just don't think it's gonna change. I mean, there's a little more, I mean, there's more pressure to change also, um, you know, the, the art of manage, I mean, there, there's a lot more data that managers are exposed to. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a push to make better decisions, a push to look after employees better, um, and to a push to put emphasis on career development, you know, all the way, you know, up, up the chain and things like that. But it has, I mean, I can say that progress, progress has been minimal. There, there are firms that are, you'll find a firm that's just great at it and you just have to be prepared to be your own champion for your own career. And, you know, especially as a woman, like you have to know how to ask for things. <laughs> we have uh, we have some questions here. So with, with 10 minutes left, I'd like to, uh, to pose some of these audience questions. So uh, the first one uh, is, could you provide a few examples of transferable skills that would help you in non-investment banking job functions? So, so I guess it's really like, if you stop being an investment banker, what are some of the skills that you develop that will help you doing something else? Janie can ask, ask that question, but <laughs> anyone, and, and all of you are investment bankers, so Janie has left, so she can talk about, but all of you have also observed people who've left and done different things. So you're, you're, you're qualified to answer this question. Anyone? I'll, I'll, I'll list a couple of them. Um, I would say resourcefulness. Um, a lot of times you're asked for things you don't know. You don't know where to get them. You don't know how to make them happen. You've got to figure it out, resourcefulness. Um, two, I would say um, mental agility. Um, being able to switch between projects, switch between ways of thinking, very quickly. Um, and I would say being compelling. Um, you can come up with a great analysis all you want, but if you can't convey it, if you can't convince somebody else of what you see and what you've learned, then it's useless. Federico, anything in terms of skills that are useful I would if say, you went into something else? Uh, I would say resilience, um, uh, the ability to work and work at it, and a little bit like optimism, but you know, put him back Humpty Dumpty every day and, and, and be determined to do that. Uh, the ability to navigate geographies and uh, professions and industrial uh, things and just try to understand what the, um, uh, again, read, read the audience and, and, and the like. And to me, um, once you, you take that, you can apply it just about everywhere, in every profession. You can move to a different country and still use it. Um, another thing uh, uh, that, that I think investment banking will teach you is uh, fundamentally sound um, analysis. Uh, you know, what makes uh, uh, the financial statements uh, tick or a company or so. Uh, don't forget, it, it is based on accounting or numbers or, or so. And, 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 and once you learn that, those are skills you can apply everywhere. You can look at a company, you look at a stock, you can look at a in a business, uh, even a, a McDonald's around the corner, it will teach you how to analyze something. Yeah, it's problem solving. It's basic pro pro solving complex problems, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the next question is uh, touching on your point about work-life balance, which a number of you made, what would your advice be to the current and incoming analysts and associates who will be working in investment banking in the 
WFH environment. I'm not sure what that is. We're from home. We're from home. We're from yeah, home. Okay. Will you will have seen the most recent reports coming from Goldman Sachs, where juniors are suffering immensely from mental and physical health issues. Surely this is not sustainable. Uh, I'm looking for the question, but hold on. There's there's no question. So well, I think <laughs> I it's, I think a, it's a statement. I just they want well, think, you to react to. Yeah, I think the question is, um, you know, what what's how would you advise you know the ju junior bankers who are coming into investment banking and, and working in the remote the sort of remote work environment? And it's it's actually a really good question because it has become a lot harder to in the current environment it has become a lot harder to um, to separate sort of you know to, to Adam's point you know integrate work and life um, in the current environment sort of work has bled into all sort of hours of the day, all days of the week. Um, and there has been sort of less structure around the work week. Um, and at the same time, it, 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 uh, it, it, it has been, it's, it's more difficult to manage your teams remotely, see what folks are up to, collaborate, um, retain that sort of culture and that, that, um, that sort of uh, collegiality that people enjoy um, going to work. And when you lose that, it, it just, the work just becomes work and it, it becomes a lot more um, painful and onerous for, for, uh, for teams. So part of the, the challenge I think is for, uh, for senior bankers and for the uh, company management to try to figure out how to preserve that type of culture in a hybrid work structure or even a, um, a remote from, you know, a, a, WF, a WFH work environment post pandemic. Um, that all being said, I still think that the sort of the revelations from the Goldman Sachs report is not too surprising. It's just the industry is very demanding. I mean, the, the work hours are very long, both at the junior and senior banker level. And um, that part of that, that is part of the challenge of the of the of the of the role. Um, and it won't change unless individual firms decide to run themselves differently. I and I will and I will say one thing, which is it's not automatic that that's the only way you can manage junior people. You know, yeah. and uh, it's it's not automatic and it's it's the culture. So I think one of the things advice is for those of you who worry about that and if that's a deterrent to you, uh, talk to the firms and see if you can find firms where they just have a different way of running, managing, right? Because it's not true that 100% of investment banks operate that way. Uh, a lot of them do. And so, but if that's a problem for you, I think try to find the places that are run a little differently and where the experience is different, right? But I, you're not going to change, but you're not going to change Goldman Sachs, right? Yeah, I mean, I think I think though that firms are trying to be a lot more mindful of it, um, and, and there is I think there is some change to, to try to make the uh, make make the, the the hours a little bit more manageable. There's definitely a push to to try to enforce protected Saturdays or protected Friday nights or Saturday nights um, across the industry, and there is a, a realization that um, that it's you know, it's a human capital driven business. The junior bankers are essential to, to the work itself and that ultimately the team will, will not succeed if, if there's high turnover of, of junior bankers. And, and there's less, I think there's a little bit less demand. Um, there's less interest in investment banking and, and more appeal of other sectors. So that, you know, the, the race for, for that talent and the need to to, to um, retain that talent in house is is become more important. And so there is, I think, there will be slow um, change to, uh, to to improve the culture there. I think Adam has a point. Adam, Adam, you're raising your hand. I am. I just I feel compelled to say this. So I I understand the whole Saturdays off or off beginning Friday nights and that kind of a thing. In all candor, you can't legislate good judgment. Um, so this is about culture. This is about communication. This is about openness. This is about respect for all individuals. Um, and Peter, to your point, which is there are firms who have architected them, their, their management and leadership philosophies around uh, 
kind of high degree of communication, high degree of making it all work for everybody. Uh, they are rare. There are teams and groups within larger firms that are not necessarily that way that do that very well, but it is about finding the people who have that as their fundamental philosophy. And Andrew, I think it's a little bit what you were saying, which is it's got to be a part of the nature of that, which is being free to express your needs, being willing to express your needs, your person, how you make your personal life fit, and then having a leadership group and a team and a culture that embraces making that happen. I know that we have many times had junior people come and say, I have this obligation, I have this opportunity with a girlfriend or spouse or whatever it might be. And we have shifted things that the client has asked for when we can called up the client. So can we give that to on Wednesday instead of Monday? You just have to have that as part of the philosophy of the way you run a business. Yeah, no, that's right. And the sad thing for a lot of these firms now is they, they, they have massive turnover. In other words, analysts aren't staying for the two years. They're leaving, they're going to buy side jobs or they're going to private equity or whatever, where the lifestyle is different and where they perceive rightly, you know, rightly or wrongly that the career opportunities are similar. And I, I so- to, to put up one, one, one slightly contrarian thing. There are a number of people that go to a uh, buy side or other job and, and then come back. There are firms, I mean, going to the buy side or going to a hedge fund or going to the private equity is not always the best solution. I mean, uh, you, 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 for instance, in some occasions, it's a zero sum game. If you don't get promoted in a private equity, you don't make the money, you work a lot, you have to, uh, to, to, to do a hundred, uh, look at a hundred deals to do one maybe, and then if your economics are spread over a period of time, if you go to business school, you don't get much. So it's not, I think that you really have to be careful about that. The other thing is that it's not necessarily true that business school is a, uh, is a necessity today. I mean, some people go, Adam, you haven't, others don't. So I think there is more flexibility here. It's good that Goldman, you know, there is this, uh, this, this uh, particular survey, although I have to say, I don't think that every single bank has 105 hours a week of work and three hours of sleep, no, five hours of sleep and going to bed at 3 a.m. I don't know if that's true for everybody. I know smaller firms are probably more flexible than, uh, than, than Goldman or so, but uh, just, you know, it, it's, it, everybody runs around with, uh, uh, you know, with the idea of boy, investment banking has to be a deadly, uh, impossible to live situation. Well, some people have survived for many years and been happy at it. So I would like to leave on a, on a optimistic note, maybe because we are optimistic by nature and not just uh, live on a, on, a, on a negative one. Um, last question, uh, and then we'll wrap up. And that is, you know, what's nice about this panel is that uh, not not everyone here has only been in investment banking, right? You know, Federico, you were in consulting, et cetera. I was in consulting and in venture capital before I went to investment banking. Any comments to just comparing investment banking to uh, consulting and you know, private equity investing, so forth, which is a common choice that, you know, you know, people graduating from, uh, you know, from Yale are making. So any kind, you don't have to compare all of them, but if you could make a few comparisons with one of these other professions that people are, are uh, trying to I choose. Let, I will let Andrew, Andrew was in consulting too before going to, to investor banking. So what do you think? Yeah, I think, um... I mean, I think that's part of the 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 the, uh, the appeal of investment banking is it is really exciting on a day to day basis. It's super fast paced. Um, your day is very unpredictable, and so you don't day to day. You don't know. Um, uh, you, you really have to be agile because you don't know what to expect, and that's part of the that's part of the excitement of it. And it's it's huge. It's high impact. You're where the action is. Um, you're directly advising uh, senior level executives of a, of a company. Um, in, in, on the M&A side, and you really you're, you're you're privileged to be in that role where you're um, you know speaking on a on an hourly you know on, on, on an hour to hour basis with um, key decision makers at a you know at, at a large a, a large company on a transaction that is a meaningful momentous and is uh, potentially transformative to the life of the executive the shareholders and the and the and the um, and the employee base. Um, 
uh, there are, I guess I think there are pros and cons of banking versus um, consulting, economic consulting, or strategy consulting, or management consulting. But I think it, it ultimately is, I think it, 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 you know, I think the, the type of work, the quality of work, work-life integration, uh, the, the nature, you know, the, the extent of travel demands and, and um, your, your sort of comfort with ambiguity or your preference for more quantitative versus qualitative work, um, more strategy driven work or transaction orientation, sort of like concrete milestones that you're pushing for, uh, pushing towards. Th those are some, uh, I think, considerations to keep in mind between the two sort of career paths. Both are professional services. So both you need to be responsive to your clients and um, meet your client demand, you know, meet, meet the demands of the clients. But um, I think uh, investment banking is, is obviously much more uh, quantitative, more um, obviously the transaction orientation and you have more sort of fixed um, goalposts or milestones that you're working towards. Um, whereas consulting is, is a little bit more ambiguous. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a little bit more nebulous, um, particularly strategy consulting on how you define the go forward growth strategy of a, of a company or how you shift, um, you know, to, to, uh, to, to, to maximize profitability. It's a little bit more open-ended. And so there, there's, um, and it's more sort of 80, 20 work versus, um, versus banking where you have to be, you, you, you will put together an analysis that you need to make sure it's hundred percent accurate and, um, and substantiated. Any other, any other comments of, of comparing the typical com professions that graduates are trying to choose between? I think Andrew has uh, definitely uh, uh, put that in traditionally some of the others that uh, uh, people will look at consulting, people will look at uh, um, investment banking, look at uh, private equity, could look at venture capital. Could look, I mean, everybody coming out of an institution such as Yale, they think uh, and they know that they are in the top 1% mentally. Uh, so you can do a lot of things. But I would like to people to consider beyond the immediate uh, because uh, in, in consulting, you end up, uh, um, instead of doing a lot of things at once, you do one thing in great detail and uh, mm -hmm. you may be likely instead of having this romantic idea, I'm gonna do uh, a consulting project in Manhattan, you end up living in, um, in, in the boonies for most of the week for six months. And you, if you're lucky, you fly back. I don't know, working from home, how it will be. And then you prepare a report, you present it, and then uh, they say, thank you, and that's it. And you have no idea whether they implement it or not. Yeah, that's so, right. Uh, at, at least uh, in m and um, mm -hmm. You, you do 10 deals, uh, you work on 10 deals, uh, uh, three will not work, five may work and three will work and you see what happens and you go around saying, I've done that or I raised that capital, I did this. So there is a feeling of accomplishment. Yeah. Which, yeah. yeah. And, that, and that was one of my reasons for moving from yeah. Maine into investment banking because the same thing, which is, you know, you didn't really end up implementing anything, right? And some people that's okay, you know, but I kind of felt that I wanted to actually see things through, right? Also, I think in consulting, I mean, I do my own, my own small consulting <laughs> business, but I think there's a personality trait that's important, whereas you have to be comfortable, you know, being airdropped into a bunch of people and an organization, not always, that, that you don't know that well. Um, and then, yes, you might work for a large firm, which brings you a certain amount of credibility, but you sort of have to be very good at, um, you know, making friends and influencing people um, easily in a new environment, um, which I, I think is a is some people thrive on it, and it can make other people quite uncomfortable, you know. So. Yeah, and I think the main theme, and we'll we'll end here. The main theme is it's all about personal fit, and if there's any message out of this, is the most important thing is to you know, have, quote, a candid view of a profession that's accurate and then seeing whether you fit into that, right? Because you're not gonna change the profession, right? But you can make, you can decide whether you, you're a really good fit or not, right? And, and, and just be honest with yourself. 
on that. And, because... and talk to people that you know have been there, uh, the ones who are there, the ones who left, try to find out why they left. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, do your due diligence, as we call it. Yeah, Just that's right. uh, do the homework. It's, uh, you know, to find out where the people are that you know they were there the year before, the people that have been there five years. So try to really understand. People are willing to, uh, especially the network is important, um, to, to give you the honest view. Oh, yeah. In um, fact, if you, if you contact uh, Yale alumni or people you know who graduated a year or two years before, and, and it's amazing how generous people will be, even if you don't know them, right? Uh, because of their feeling of allegiance to the school and pick people who are willing to be helpful to you and sort of tailor their answer to what you know you can help them understand about yourself. So look, I must say I there is no question that this panel has succeeded in matching the title Candid View of Miss Mbanky, right? And I really want to thank, I'm really pleased because we got four very knowledgeable but very diverse opinions, right? And that's really very important for this exercise. So I want to thank the four of you. It's been a pleasure uh, being your moderator. And I want to thank all of you who are attending and just tell you uh, the next one is April 15th on the legal profession. So if you're thinking between legal and investment banking, you might want to sign up for that. So thank you all. And uh, thank you again, uh, Adam, Jane, Andrew, and Federico for really making this a real wonderful panel. Peter, thank you. All together. Thank you.